All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today, uh, this talk is about designing secure cloud-based web and mobile applications. I'm uh, Farshad Abbasi. I'm with uh, Mirai Security currently. Uh, we're based in Vancouver, Canada. That's where I, I'm based and pretty much have lived here most of my life. Um, I'm a co-founder. I'm the co-founder of Mirai Security with uh, my two partners. It's a security company that's been around for about six months roughly since last August. I'm also the CTO and CISO of Mature Technologies. It's a software company building a uh, services platform similar to Amazon but for services. I'm an also a uh, instructor at BCIT just down the street. I teach, guess what, security. I've been teaching security there for about 16 years. Um, at BCIT, I teach a couple of different security courses, so if there are any of you that are interested in that, you can come talk to me. Uh, it, it's a pretty good course, uh, or courses, I would say. Um, I'm also a news correspondent for CFAX AM 1070 in Victoria. I talk about security, of course. What else would I talk about? And I'm also a board member of B-Sides Vancouver, which is another really good uh, security conference that you should all check out. It happens in March. Uh, it takes, over, takes uh, place March 12 and 13, Monday, Tuesday. Um, and we cover a broad spectrum of topics within security. It's a fairly cheap conference. Tickets are like 30 bucks, so it's a good one to attend. And I'm also a board member of uh, MARS, which stands for Mainland Advanced Research Society. We're a nonprofit organization, which besides is one of our uh, main events that we produce, but we also produce several meetups, uh, including uh, ready room briefings that are once a month focused on you know, security talks. We do a social advanced city sec as well as uh, I'm the OWASP chapter leader for Vancouver OWASP, which we just relaunched. Uh, we had our first session last Thursday. We, we uh, intend to present the uh, OWASP sessions every other month for those of you that are interested. I'm also an avid music fan. So a lot of different things that I do. Um, again, if you uh, want to talk about any of that, come after the talk and, and we can chat. But today's topic is really about uh, um, you know, application cloud security. It was interesting because I was actually approached originally to build this talk for IBM's uh, global technical leaders. And you know, they do these monthly talks with their solution architects and technical leaders. And of course, everything is going into the cloud and there's a lot of focus on application security. So they came to me and they said, hey, we want a talk that kind of covers mobile and web applications and cloud. And I was like, well, how do I tie this whole thing together? I need to find a, a, a piece that glues all this stuff together. And hence, I came up with this presentation. And it's, a, it's not meant to, you know, you, you can't walk away out of this and be like, well, yeah, I'm a cloud security expert and I'm a, and a web application expert or a mobile expert. Th th each of those topics are something that I could teach uh, or I do teach a whole course on, on, on some of those topics or we could sit here uh, for hours and talk about them. The main uh, intention of this presentation is for you to walk away and just have that under broad understanding of what, uh, what is available to you and how you should be thinking about uh, you know, designing secure applications that are going into the cloud. And so that, that's what I'm really trying to do with this presentation is provide, uh, sort of spark that conversation and that thinking uh, and, and, and you know, point to some of the resources that are available out there that can be utilized um, in that journey as you guys move towards uh, re-architecting applications or, uh, or doing that. So we're going to talk about what are some of the key changes that are happening within, uh, just out there in the business world, not necessarily in IT, and what are those changes and how those changes are driving uh, this re-architecture and moving into the cloud and some of the other things and then what you should consider as that change is happening. And then uh, we start by talking about some of the uh, resources that are available primarily by OWASP or the Cloud Security Alliance. These are all free resources uh, that are available through these organizations and how you should use them and, and, and leverage them uh, throughout your journey. So we talk about the uh, security by design principles uh, that are provided by OWASP, and then some cloud security concepts. So really starting at the fund foundational levels, right? Security shouldn't be an afterthought. Security shouldn't be something that you plug in at the end when the system is built, right? Like as you're designing and architecting that system, you should be thinking about that security. And that's where the first place is the security by design principles. And then, then okay, now you've got to architect the application, but you also got to figure out where this is going to be hosted. So typically in these modern, uh, with these modern applications, you're going to be hosting them in the cloud. And then we're going to look at what are the top cloud computing threats. Uh, again, these are provided by the Cloud Security Alliance. And we'll go through that and then look at what, um, what sort of controls are recommended and how you could Frame, uh, uh, frame, frame your architecture and design and all the activities that you're doing uh, in a structured manner according to this uh, controls framework that's available. And then we'll also talk about container security because that's a big buzzword. Um, you know, as applications are being re-architected and modernized and put into the cloud, containers are playing a big part in that. So we'll have a quick look and see what they are, how they fit into the picture, and what some of the security considerations are for those of you that are uh, using that technology. 
And so this starts from foundations, goes into some of the cloud hosting and cloud issues, and then it's like now you're building that application. So mo a lot of modern applications, the architectures involve some sort of an API, right? Even your client server type applications, there's an API that's exposed, and then there's some sort of web, web client that sits on the uh, browser end, right? So just have a quick look at what are some of the security considerations that should be given when you're you know, looking at uh, APIs or if you're trying to re-architect your applications and leverage APIs. And then we'll close it off uh, by looking at the, the distribution channels, right? So you built this application, you figured out how the, you know, you, you're looking at some of the concerns with respect to hosting in the cloud, and then now you got delivery channels, and typically uh, in this day and age, they're either mobile or web, right? I mean, there are still companies that are delivering green screen or other, other channels, but these are the two typical channels. So we'll quickly look at what uh, you should consider when you're building for those channels, and then we'll wrap it up with a Q&A. Hopefully there's some time for that. So with that said, um, and, and yeah, please, uh, do, you know, if we run out of time for q and I'll be happy to hang out here for a bit and, and answer uh, any of questions that you may have that may not fit in within our allotted time. So now that you got an idea of what this presentation is going to cover, let's talk about what changes are coming and how this is driving application re-architecture and pushing things into the cloud, right? So a lot of businesses right now are being forced, uh, uh, they're going through this whole digital transformation, right? I heard of this term like three years ago, I had no idea, this, oh, another buzzword, right? Digital transformation, what does it really mean? What it really means is that every company, you know, I mean, it started with a lot of like financial institutions and banks, right? They said, you know what, let's, we're, we're gonna move away from branches. Customers don't wanna go walk into a branch. They wanna be able to have anytime, anywhere access to our application, right? And, and this is sort of cascaded into all industries where they're looking at every business process that they're doing today, whether it's uh, paper forms, whether it's uh, you know, ordering uh, food over the telephone, or any of those traditional models of doing business or processes within that business are being challenged. And companies are looking at ways that they can uh, utilize computer technology or automation and digitally transform those manual processes or things that were traditionally done brick and mortar or on paper and really bring all that and make it digital, right? That's what digital transformation is about. And as that's happening, that requires a lot of agility, right? You, it requires adoption of new technologies. You can't think of the same way, you know, oh yeah, we're gonna have uh, an old data center with a bunch of hardware where you're gonna have uh, an application that's gonna be available to millions of people and has to scale out really quickly based on demand. So you really have to look at new ways of architecting and building applications that can be agile. You can take, uh, you know, if there's a, all of a sudden if something is not working for your consumers, you can in incorporate new features into that application really quickly. You know, these are things that were not possible with the old ways of building sort of monolithic client server type apps hosted in, uh, in, in, in you know, uh, uh, traditional data centers that are not very flexible. They don't provide with, for, uh, for that uh, speed of integration of new features or uh, scaling out and all the, all the other things that are required to meet the needs for a digital transformation. And uh, as a part of this come uh, things like you know, using APIs or using cloud-related technologies. So those are the two ingredients of digital transformation, right? Really, uh, a, a lot of people, as they're going through this journey, they're adopting these technologies. And you know, things like VMs or containers, uh, building microservices or adopting software-oriented architectures. And this really has a wide impact to existing policies, existing processes, tools, standards, and even how the teams are formed, right? I mean, you can't have the traditional model where you have a team of 100 building this monolithic app. There's a lot of dependencies. You're trying to put a new feature. It has to go through a lengthy change request. You need things to be agile, fast. You need to be able to respond to customer demands really quickly. So it's not just you know adopting cloud and APIs. It's really like rebuilding how your teams work together, rebuilding how processes work, how, how quickly you can respond to things and, 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 and you know, deal with security. Security. So it's a holistic, um, you know, end-to-end uh, uh, -end consideration that needs to be given uh, as, as organizations go through digital transformation. And, and there's a lot of pressure uh, due to the massive digital disruption that's coming along. So the real takeaways here are that infrastructure is moving to the cloud and being deployed as code, right? So it's really, it's not really, I mean, it, there is hardware at the end of the day, but really when you're building these, these uh, uh, cloud-based infrastructures, it's really like you, you can almost apply uh, software development practices to that, right? Because you're essentially writing some code, you know, whether that, that code eventually translates into some inf virtual infrastructure, but you really are building it as code. So you can apply those things like version control and a lot of other uh, best practices that, are, that have been tried, tested in, uh, uh, for, for a number of years into software development methodologies. All those lessons learned can be applied here. And uh, applications themselves, as I mentioned earlier, they're being re-architected, they're being broken into microservices, and the reason 
that is being done is that, you know, again, it provides that agility and that independence, right? So if you could think of it as that if you had an application in the past that might do six or seven things and that was built by a team of 100, you know, you had like your nightly build, right? And if one team member broke something, it would break the entire application. So all the other functions wouldn't be able to build because there was one piece that, you know, someone was writing that was a dependency onto that, right? Now, if you take this and break it into six separate teams with six separate functions, and each of those are independent, well, if this one team doesn't deliver their part or breaks the build, well, it's only going to impact them because the other teams are independent micro delivering independent microservices that get deployed into uh, a to typically into a container. So it really, it's a really uh, a nice way of providing that independence and being able to deploy things and, and, you know, and, and being agile which lends its, itself into agile development processes and DevOps and all that stuff, which again is the topic for a, uh, another talk in, in and of itself. So and, and in summary, digital transformation is re resulting in more web and mobile applications that are typically served from the cloud. So this really uh, brings about a whole new way of thinking in terms of security. You know, like in the past, if you had a, a monolithic application that was just all the services were in one, one place, you just have to worry about one entry point, right? So you, there's an authentication entry Entry point, you 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 protected that, and then once the uh, user was within the application, then they could roam about security because you ensured that you had enforced authentication at that entry point. Now you're taking this application and you're breaking it into six pieces. Well, where's the gateway? You know, are you where are you controlling access to each of those services, right? So you need to think of okay, well, do I need an API gateway? Do I need to sort of have that single entry point uh, to enforce my security policies? And how do you bring that about in this in this sort of Mod modernized, broken down microservices and, and API world. So, so before we uh, get into some of the other considerations, one of the first things, you know, if you're building a new system or a new application, it's really a good idea to start thinking about security right from the start, right? I think I saw one of these reports from Gartner or one of these companies and they were talking about uh, the fact that 52% of defects, security and non-security included, could have been prevented if uh, the requirements were better. So if there was the security person at the table during the, the stage where the requirements are being defined, they could put in those uh, elements of security uh, into the requirements that would translate into better design. And then when that design is translated into something that's developed, you've already got security taken care of because it was already baked in into the requirements at the early stages. 52%, that's a pretty high figure, right? So if you don't have security, at the table in that early stage, or what the buzzword these days is, shift left, right? They're calling it shift left. What it really that means is moving it as early to the, moving it uh, to the uh, earlier stages as early as possible, right? Like that's like that's what this buzzword is about. Is rather than you know all the way out of the right here where the application is completed and built and deployed, that's the traditional model, right? You take an application that's finished, you do a pen test on it. That's not the best way to do it. That, now you're gonna go, okay, well here's a list of ten problems. Go and fix it. That application's finished. That development team has been working on that for a year, it's going to cost a lot of money to go and change it. I mean, yeah, some of those things might be simple bug fixes that can be changed, but if it requires an architecture or design change, that's going to be pretty costly because this thing is already finished. I mean, it's gone through the stages and is, is developed. But if you quote unquote shift things to the left and really get, uh, get in there, get security in there as early as possible, right? So that they're in there at the requirement stage, they can bake in the, the, the security controls into that requirement and design and prevent all those costly uh, defects and, and mitigations later on. So that's what uh, oh, uh, the security by design principles is about. I mean, it's funny because OWASP has got the uh, security by design principles that I'm going to talk about. But you know, companies like Amazon are also providing that as a, as a practice. So a, as a best practice, I mean, security by design means that really put the security into the design before you go and build something. And, and that's just common sense, right? When we go and build a, a building or a bridge, we don't go and just build things ad hoc, right? We always take all the different criteria in terms of if I'm building a bridge, what is the uh, you know, strongest wind that could come here? You think of all the potential factors that could stress that particular bridge, right? And so why aren't we doing that with security? I'm gonna build this application, why am I not thinking of those factors that could put this application to stress, which is attacks and various other, various other things, and really take those into consideration and build them into our design at the early stage. So you got a strong foundation that you've built upon, and that requires that shift in thinking. So OWASP has put together this, this uh, security by design principles guideline, and it's a guidance to produce secure apps by design. 
And it's before uh, determining the controls, you basically classify the assets first and consider the mo most likely attackers. So you're doing that sort of pseudo threat modeling really early on. And that's what threat modeling is, right? Really modeling the different, here are the assets, here are the particular uh, threat actors, and what are the threat scenarios that could come out of this. And let's build controls that prevent that from happening. So while you're going through that process, you, know, you should consider the C, the I, and the A uh, when building those controls. So like, what are the confidentiality issues? What are the potential integrity issues and availability issues? And uh, this will really help you produce more robust controls, right? Just like I mentioned in the bridge example, if you don't take into account that there could be heavy wind and shake this bridge and you just build the bridge, when the wind does come, it may not come today or in 30 years, but when it does eventually come, then your bridge will get destroyed. So similar here, attackers are not going to come every day, but if you haven't thought of the potential uh, attacks and build controls in your application, then you're not really ready for it, right? Then, yeah, you could do some patchwork and put a WAF in front of it or put this thing in front of it, but that's not really, that's not the real way of addressing it, right? The bridge should be built you know, st with strong enough foundations and hardened enough so that it can withstand uh, the attacks when, when, or uh, the uh, disasters when they come about. So it's really having good security architecture is just as important as architecture in the real world, right? As I mentioned, the bridge example. But a lot of people don't think that way. We do that in the real world. We put a lot of emphasis uh, on architecture when we're building buildings or bridges and all the infrastructure in the physical world. But when it comes to the digital world, we, we, I guess the industry is not mature enough, right? Like the uh, building, uh, Builders Association and architects and those guys, these, these are hundreds of years old. They've got practices and engineering uh, organizations and all that stuff. But software, you know, at most, what is it? It's like 50, 60 years old, engineering practices have not, uh, have not uh, strengthened in that same way, but we're getting there. There are already uh, you know, these frameworks that are available and processes and practices, security by design principle, all these things that uh, people are, are pushing out there that hopefully will get the software engineering practice or, or systems engineering to the same place as we are today in the physical world. So let's look at uh, just quickly here, the, the 10 security by design principles. Again, you can go to the OWASP page. They've got details on all these things and case studies and everything else. But just as a, so that you get a taste of what they are, is minimizing attack surface area. They're all fairly common sense, right? So when you're designing this thing, ask yourself these questions. Put this in front of you. And as you're going through your design journey, am I... Are, are these applicable, and am I doing something about that in my design, right? And if the question is, well, that's not applicable, then great. But if it is, are you doing something? Are you putting a, a, a requirement in that uh, uh, you know, systems requirements document or however it is that you do your requirements in order to, to uh, account for this? Are you establishing secure defaults? Are you uh, following the principle of least privilege? Are you following the principle of defense, defense in depth, right? This is a really important one. A lot of people say, well, I've got you know, a, a service-oriented architecture of microservices services, and I'm only doing input validation uh, at my user interface. Well, the question is, well, what if this microservice in the back end where you're not doing user validation, what if it talks to another microservice, right? This is a very agile environment. You're building these services so that they can talk to any other service. So if you say, well, you know, uh, my front end is doing the input validation, my service, the back end service shouldn't do it. Well, what if that back end service tomorrow talks to a different front end and that front end is not doing input validation, right? Are you doing your defense in depth approach? Are you, are you, are you following this principle and putting input validation everywhere? Any service that's receiving input over HTTP should be doing that, right? Not just the front end ones, right? Because those back end services could be talking to other front end services that may not be as hardened. So defense in depth, always really important. And a lot of times, you know, I work with clients that they're like, hey, this, but this control is, is so, it, it has so little impact. But, you know, it's like my, my mother taught me, right? Every penny counts. If you collect all the pennies, you'll be rich one day, right? So that's the th same thing. Every control counts, even though they may be really weak or they may seem insignificant. When you combine them all together, together, they'll be very significant and they'll slow down the attacker. On their own, they may not be. But as you add them up, they will add, um, you know, uh, add to your defense strength. Failing security is, security is really important. Again, a lot of people, when they're designing systems, they don't really talk, think about that. I use the bridge example, right? Like, it may, you know, when it fails, is it failing security? Failure is going to happen. It's not that your application is never going to fail. And I think Bruce Schneier, who's one of the authorities in, this, in the field of security, he said once that you know, it's not how good you put all these defenses and all these strengths and putting a firewall and all these other things. You know, that's, that's great to have, but your system will fail. And have you planned for how good it fails, right? Because when it fails, is the whole thing going to blow up? And I think he used an experience that he had. He'd gone to an airport. I think it was the Los Angeles airport in the mid-2000s. And what had happened is all the different gates 
that lead into the, you know, the area where you wait. Uh, so you go through the security scanner, right? You put your laptop, take off your shoes, and you go through that security check. And then in that airport, everyone that went through any of those security checks, no matter what flight, they were all ending up in the same common waiting area. So what had happened is one person uh, went through one of the gates, and he had a gun or some sort of weapon, and the machine didn't pick it up right away. So it picked it up half an hour later, and then they're like, oh, well, we don't know where this guy has gone, right? Because once you go through that security, that's a common area. So all the different gates, uh, the, the waiting area is common. So they, what they had to do is empty everybody out and then get everybody to go through the security checks again. But what, if they had segregated that, so if like, you know, the first three security um, uh, you know, scanners led you to like the five gates and then the other three led you to the other five gates, then if one of the scanners fails, then you only have to empty out the people that, are, that have gone through in that, in that segregated area. So compartmentalization is really important in that case, right? So again, the scanner will fail, but are you, when it fails, have you, in this case, compartmentalized your environment so that you only have to deal with the issue instead of emptying out everybody out of the airport, right? So it's, it, this fail security is really important. Have you designed your application so when it fails, and it will fail, how, how bad is the, the blast radius or the impact of that failure, right? Don't trust services. And this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. You, if, you know, everyone is going to service-oriented architecture, microservices. We're taking our monolithic applications and breaking them into these small components. That's wonderful, right? It's great. It's agile, uh, reusable components, less dependency. But uh, how do you trust? Where's the trust in that? How do these small services or microservices, how do they trust each other? Have you built the right trust model, right? Like, how do you know that this other person, uh, this other component that's talking to you, who are they? What are, do you have tokens? Are they signed tokens? Have you even thought about that? A lot of organizations I've worked with, they're like, well, they're inside our data center, so why do I have to worry about that? Well, people will get into your data center. They might put a rogue application. You might get rogue requests. Your data center might be available to your employees that might generate packets from their laptops. Who knows, right? Just because it's in your internal network, that doesn't mean that that service is safe and you can trust anybody that's talking to it. So you really have to have a strong trust model and figuring out who it is that you trust or you don't. Separation of duties, you know, common sense. Don't really have to talk about this one much. Uh, avoiding security by obscurity. Again, I hope that you know you. This is something that we don't do a lot. Again, I see this all the time. Oh well, no one knows that IP address or no, the classic example. Like no one is going to know that URL. Well, you know, people will figure it out. They'll do you know war driving and find the IP address and all kinds of other things. So you know, don't do this. You know, I mean. But, uh, what else can I say about that, right? And keeping things simple, don't over-architect. Uh, if you try to do this uh, and over-engineer or over-architect, the solution gets really complex, and then you'll be the only one that understands it, or maybe in the future you might not even remember what you've designed because it's so complicated. So really, this is keeping things simple, which I think we've all been told this since the young ages. And last but not least, Fix security issues correctly, right? Spend the time, understand what that security issue is. When you get that pen report, pen test report, don't just like throw it on the side. Sit down with the pen tester, make sure that they understand it, and then they convey that to you so that you understand it as well and fix it appropriately so that it doesn't happen again. So these are foundational principles that should be taken into consideration as early as possible. But once you've done that, so now let's step back and go, okay, now let's go from the cloud. We'll, we'll discuss our, we'll, we'll, we'll have our conversation in terms of security. We'll start from the cloud. We'll go to like, you know, containers and APIs, and then we'll look at the channels of delivery. So cloud security. I hope that you have a high level understanding, but if you don't, here's the NIST definition of cloud computing. So I'll just read that verbatim. It's a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, e.g. networks, servers, storage, applications, and services that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction, right? Kind of wordy, but I hope it puts it into perspective. And if it doesn't, let's look at the four models of cloud computing. So really, cloud computing is about this pool of stuff that you're not aware, you just want a resource, right? And then it gets allocated to you. But there are different isolation mechanisms. It's not that straightforward. I mean, you, these are the four different isolation mechanisms, and they result in different models of cloud computing, right? A lot of you are pr probably familiar with uh, SaaS, right? SaaS is a form of cloud computing. You've got a shared application. It's out there. Multiple people are using it, right? The separation boundary there is the user accounts, right? Your user account separates your ap application space from the other person. So that's SaaS, and as we go like from here to up, 
there's very little control to more control. So with SaaS, you have very little control. I mean, all you get is within your application account, you might be able to configure preferences and things like that, but you can't configure which, uh, which database you want to use or how often it gets backed up or any of that stuff. All the stuff underneath it is abstracted from you. And as you go higher, you get more control, but so you see, then the next level down from there is containerization. And that's also known as OS level virtualization. And the reason for that is the abstraction layer is the operating system. So you, the, uh, you have your own machine, you have your own virtual machine. And if you're in there, it looks like you have a full machine, but underneath it, you're sharing that operating system kernel with the other tenants, right? So the other virtual machines there, they're sharing that kernel with you. So they, that's why it's called OS level virtualization. And that's a technology that's used to deliver CAS or PaaS, that stands for container as a service or platform as a service. And then as you move up, you get more control, you get virtualization. And that's the one everybody's familiar with at VMware, virtual machines, EC2 instances, Google Compute Engine. Those are just virtual machines, full machine. It's got a kernel, it's got the full stack operating system. It's a full machine that runs on top of a hypervisor, right? So the separation there is the hypervisor. Here the separation was the user accounts. Here's the separation was the operating system. Here's the separation layer is the uh, the boundary is the hypervisor, and it's used to provide infrastructure as a service, right? So when we're talking about IaaS, it's just raw infrastructure. It's like, here's some compute, here's some storage, and here's some network, you figure it out. So there's more control, because you can deploy your own whatever you want on top of that, right? And then ultimately, if you're really concerned, so here, so before I go to that one, vulnerabilities at this level are related to CPU or hypervisor. I mean, even last year, there was an issue with Amazon with their hypervisor, right? So you, it's never 100% secure. You, if there are hypervisor vulnerabilities, someone could go from one virtual machine to another. But because the technology has been around for a while, a lot of those issues have been addressed. You know, the, if this was like 10 years ago, yeah, there'd be a lot more problems. But over the last 10 or X number of years, this technology has been out there. A lot of people have had a chance to play with it and come up with uh, and find vulnerabilities and address them. And that's one of the key principles in security is use technologies that have stood the test of time, right? And have seen a lot of eyes. The more eyes that look at it and the longer it's out there, then the more vulnerabilities will be found and the more secure the application becomes as a result. So, and then finally is the physical separation, which is also called bare metal cloud. And if you're, so if you're concerned about covert channels and you know, defects in hardware protection mechanisms and all those other things, which again, isn't crazy, right? Like those concerns are not crazy. We see, we saw the, the issue with the Intel processor. There was uh, the, the covert channel issue. There have been a number of attacks uh, regarding covert channels. So if, if you're the type of organization, uh, you know, you might be like the US military or, or, or FBI or someone with really confidential information, you may want, and you, want, you still want cloud, you go with bare metal cloud. In that case, you're dedicated a set of hardware that's yours. You're not sharing it with others, but it's still abstracted from you. you when you ask for a machine, you're given a virtual machine, but it's, you, there's a one-on-one -on -one mapping between those machines and physical hardware that's been dedicated to you and you're not sharing that with other organizations. So these are all the different models and basically cloud computing, you know, the, the four models, uh, they depend on which, which workload isolation mechanism is utilized. So you can see here in the picture, you can see more control down here and less control down there, right? So as you go to SAS, there's less control and as you go to bare metal, there's more control and you can see that here, it's just like your end users are involved, right? Your application architects can't really change the architecture of a SAS application. But with PaaS and your other, you know, with PaaS is more the, the application architects and developers that are using PaaS, right? PaaS is just like, it gives you everything you need. All you need to do is deploy your code in there. You don't need to set up your database. You don't need to set up a web server. That's all abstracted from you, but you still have control. You can build applications and put it in there. But when you get down here to IaaS or bare metal, it's like you need your infrastructure people to go in there because you need to actually figure out, oh yeah, I need to put these EC2 machines and I need to configure the network this way so that the, the people that deal with this layer are, are typically infrastructure architects or administrators in an organization. So lessons here, cloud security is shared responsibility and, and you know, it's not that, okay, yeah, I'm using Amazon or Google and my responsibility is done. There are things that they will do to protect your data and they're responsible for, and there are things that you need to do uh, to protect your system and application data that you're responsible for. And that's why it's called a share, shared responsibility model. And those things are, um, you know, so the, the cloud provider's responsibilities, uh, they need to ensure that the infrastructure is secure, right? Because they, they're the providers of that infrastructure, whether it's IaaS or PaaS or whatever it is, 
they are providing that to you. So they need to make sure that those OS images are hardened and that uh, the, the, the network environment that they're provisioning is secure and their staff are uh, screened and all that other stuff and that your data and applications are protected. But there's only so much that they can do, right? Because they're providing you with the infrastructure and then you're configuring it in a certain way, right? So it's like, you know, when you, even in the physical world, when you buy a firewall, right, Cisco will make sure that that firewall is built securely and it's got, you know, the best and all that stuff in it. But if you don't configure that firewall properly and just go put it in your network and open all the ports, it's not going to help you, right? It could be the best firewall, but it's not going to help you. And it's the same thing here. Amazon or Google or Azure or Microsoft, they'll provide you with the infrastructure components and they're responsible for making sure that those have been designed properly and they're secure and operated in a secure way. But ultimately, you still have a, a, a control over configuration and your, the applications you deploy and that's where the shared responsibility comes in. So as a customer, you must take measures to fortify the application. So are you hardening your application? That's not their responsibility. That's your application. And are you using uh, strong authentication and are you putting additional security controls? Um, you know, so okay, great, they've got, like, you know, they provide you with, uh, Amazon provides you with security groups. Are you configuring them to ensure that they're working the right way uh, for your environment? And uh, as the, the general security concerns with cloud uh, are, are multi-tenancy, so a lot of the issues roll into that. Regulatory and compliance, unauthorized shadow IT, uh, and intellectual property law. So those are the general concerns that when you're moving into the cloud environment, you should be giving uh, some consideration to. And key management and access control are really important. So when I'm consulting on cloud projects for companies that are moving from on-prem to cloud, those are like the two areas I say, you know what, we can, there's a lot of things we need to do, but the two things we really need to get right is how you're doing your key management. And they're like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, you got API keys, you got keys for your application, you got this key, that key. Who's configuring them? Where are they coming from? You know, like in the old days, you might have an on-prem, you had an IT security team and they may log the keys and they hand them out to users. Now, how are you, how's that model shifting and adopting for the cloud? And an access control, and how are you doing that correctly? So I think those are really important um, things to consider. So just real quick, um, you know, we only have about 15 minutes left, so I'm not going to go into too much detail into these things. But this is the CSA is the Cloud Security Alliance. They're an organization that provide a lot of good resources. So if you're going into the world of cloud, they've got excellent frameworks, guidelines, documents, lots of really good resources that are free, freely available. Of course, they offer paid services as well, but you can get a lot of good stuff. So if you're going down your cloud journey and you're trying to figure out, you know, you want to move your, your data center from on-prem to the cloud, one of the first things you should do is read through this, this, this uh, top cloud computing threats and really think about you know, what are these threats, what do they mean, and is what you're designing, uh, building, uh, going to be designed to, uh, to uh, address these concerns, right? And if you can address these 10 concerns, you're pretty good. There may be more concerns than this, but these are the top ones. So if you've, if you've thought these through by doing security by design, right? If you go through these in advance and build uh, uh, mitigations in your, in your system, then you've done a good job. And there are things like data breaches, um, you know, uh, so this is like because it's shared resources, <coughs> all kinds of people have access to this, right? When you put your data in an S3 bucket, yeah, it's your virtual S3 bucket, but under the hood, this is shared hard drives that a lot of people are, are their, op, their, their personnel might have access to. They might be outsourcing some of that stuff to a third party. It's a cloud. You have no idea what's in there, right? So the, the data breaches could happen uh, as uh, due to some uh, 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 unauthorized access and so on and so forth. Uh, weak identity, credentials, and access management is a concern. A lot of uh, people are not using multi-factor authentication. Uh, they don't have uh, scalable IAM or key rotation. Uh, insecure APIs, right? You're like, how is this related to cloud security? Well, again, as I was saying earlier, a lot of people that are going into the cloud, they're also, they're, some people are taking their traditional applications and just moving that workload straight over, and that's totally fine. But to really take advantage of the cloud, you should take that workload and see how you could rebuild it. How can I refactor, re-architect that application to take advantage of those facilities that the cloud provides, right? For example, key management, right? AWS, Azure, these systems offer great uh, uh, security, hardware, hardware security modules or software security modules or KMS, key management services, that a lot of people that have built their own applications aren't doing a very good job at doing that. So you could easily, when you move your application to the cloud, if you just re-architect the key management piece and tie that into the KMS system that Amazon provides, all of a sudden now you're taking advantage of a better, they, you know, they're using uh, hardened systems to protect that key, they do the key rotation for you, uh, they remove the, the, uh, the 
the uh, requirement for you to pass these keys around. So there are a lot of cloud native uh, services that are great, but that require some adjustment to the application and typically you know, uh, uh, modernizing and APIizing that application. So insecure APIs come in, and you know, exposing sensitive assets to the outside. Now you're exposing things as APIs, you know, in this walled garden where everything used to sit in is now open. So how are you doing that security to make sure that that, that data doesn't get, uh, uh, to, you know, the APIs are not called by the wrong people? Have you thought? Have you put in the right API security architecture, right? And, and that, again, that can be a topic of a, a huge topic of conversation in and of itself. Uh, number four is system and application vulnerabilities. So again, you're in a shared environment. You know, there's shared memory and resources, and that opens up new attack surfaces because if one application blows up, they have access to shared resources, then your, your system may be using that, uh, those resources and then you'd be vulnerable to it. Account hijacking, I mean, this is nothing new, but the impact is amplified. So you think about this. In the old days, okay, someone hijacked your application, that's great, they can blow up the application. But now, the infrastructure is all as code. It's all virtualized and put in your AWS account. Someone hijacks that account, they can click delete, and then all of a sudden, there goes your data center, right? Because you know, in the physical world, you want to blow up that data center, you have to physically go access that room and maybe take a bomb and blow it up. But now, you just take over an account, click delete, and then when the AWS account is deleted, every Every single virtual machine, every single network, all that stuff is gone. So that's like blowing up your data center with just hijacking an account, right? So really, that's why the effect is amplified um, in, in, this, in the cloud world. Malicious insiders, again, this is also nothing new, but it has an impact in the cloud world. So sysadmins can have access to uh, sensitive systems or data that they shouldn't have access to. APTs, uh, data loss, uh, insufficient due diligence. You know, a lot of companies ju jump into cloud without really considering what the legal uh, implications may be. They may not design it correctly, right? Like there may be a company that says, "Well, the data shouldn't leave Canada," and then they go use AWS, and then they don't even look at what region they're putting the data, and it's all in the U.S. Uh, West <laughs> region, right? You need to really do the due diligence and what sort of regulation are you, do you need to abide to? Uh, what are the implications if you don't do that? And then uh, architect your solution accordingly with the right provider. Um, abuse and nefarious use of cloud services. Uh, you know, some, some cloud services can be used for uh, DDoSing or doing spamming and things like that. Uh, denial of service, so there may be a target, someone might target a service that's running in the same shared premises as yours, and when that resource is being bombarded, you might be impacted as well because you're sharing that. And also shared technology vulnerabilities, right? Because you might be using the same libraries as everybody else uh, that, that's using that provider. They might be providing a version of Linux and everybody's using that version of Linux, right? You're sharing that technology so that you're impacted if that provider is not updating their technology. So real quick, uh, again, the Cloud Security Alliance provides this. So how do you mitigate that? So those were the top threats, but the CSA also provides a uh, cloud control matrix. So it's a set of security controls that should be considered as you're building your system. And they are, uh, there's a number of categories. I'm not going to go through them, but they range from everything from application and interface security to controls related to threat and vulnerability management. For those of you who've seen like various controls frameworks, like Sys Top 20 and all that other stuff, similar, and this actually cross-references those other frameworks like NIST and ISO and Sys Top 20 and so on and so forth, but really puts a heavy emphasis on cloud. So what are those additional things you need to consider? So it's got all the traditional stuff, a lot of the stuff you're like, oh yeah, why is it in here? I've seen this in other frameworks. Well, this is, tries to create a holistic framework that addresses your entire system, but focusing on those additional uh, security controls that are required. Quick. Uh, topic on containers. Containers, as I mentioned earlier, they're also uh, known as OS level virtualization. It, they provide you with multiple isolated user space instances. So the key thing is that kernels shared, right? With virtual, with traditional virtualization, that virtual machine, you got your own kernel, you got your own operating system. You're not sharing, right? You're not. Let's call the kernel the brain. With containers, the brain's shared. There's only one kernel that's running, and the separation comes by using namespaces. So Linux kernel and, and now Windows, they're providing these uh, the ability to to uh, separate your namespace. What's a namespace? Well, example, when you have like process IDs or network interface names or just usernames, right? In traditional operating system, there's no separation. You know, all your network interfaces will appear when you do a, you know, if config, for example, right? Or all the users are visible to that one person running that operating system. But if you provide a mechanism to separate this and you can have separate user namespaces or separate network uh, namespaces or separate file namespaces, and now you can have these virtual machines that are sharing the same kernel but taking advantage of that namespace separation and a few other mechanisms to provide you with, uh, with this environment where you can all live together in this jailed environment. So when you're in a container, it looks like a regular machine. 
So the containerization, just to see the difference between virtualization, they share the same kernel. You, and that means you can't run containers with different operating systems on the same container environment, right? Because they share the kernel, you all have to be either Windows or whatever that, that kernel is. But because there's only one kernel, it, it, they're faster and they're lighter and more portable. And they scale really efficiently, right? Because you've already booted that kernel. You don't have to, full, when you're you know, in, uh, 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 popping up a new instance, a virtual machine, you don't have to start from scratch and then boot everything and all the drivers. That's already done. So that's why they're really quick to fire up. And that's why the, the agile and DevOps world really loves that, right? Because it's quick. You can kill them and restart them and all that stuff without waiting for 10 minutes. You can fire up a whole infrastructure. So they're great. Um, but they don't provide the same level of uh, isolation as virtualization. Uh, virtualization is more mature with an extensive system, uh, ecosystem, and it allows you to uh, mix kernels on the same platform. Uh, and the host emulates the hardware provided to the VM in that case. And it looks like it's running on separate hardware. And here, the hypervisor is the security boundary, right? Here, the kernel is the security boundary. Here's the hypervisor. Kernel has lots of attack surface. There's lots of ways to get it in a kernel. There's a lot of uh, bits. And plus, you got all the libraries. And those libraries may not be written well. So when you're sharing this library that a third party wrote, the now it's being shared across a few virtual machines. Again, that increases your attack surface. But hypervisors are written to be really tight and really small, and, and there's a lot less uh, in terms of attack surface, so that's more secure. And here you can see in a, a, a pictorial here, here you've got uh, hypervisor type 2, you've got the guest OSs and the separate kernels. Here is your container where you've got a host OS, and then all these different apps are sharing that OS, and you've got the container runtime that manages that, you know, kills those containers or starts new ones. So, Containers are very useful. Uh, they help software management. Work has been done to address security issues, and there are still lots of security issues. I got a whole talk that I've been doing over the last year at various security conferences on that topic. If you're interested, it's on my website. And they should be used uh, with caution. So uh, processes in the containers should not be given privileged access, right? And uh, they're good for deploying apps uh, that are trusted, that are from the same vendor. And other mechanisms should be enforced, like SC Linux with policies, SecComp, AppArmor, and separate user accounts to, uh, to mitigate that. Um, you should group containers on a VM based on classic segregation principles, right? The same way when you do your network security, if you were to design a network for a company, you look at the different types of functions and users and you create subnets based on the criticality of their function or the data. Same sort of thing, right? Create uh, uh, zones and then utilize the container separation technologies that are provided to separate similar containers with similar impact uh, or based on some sort of risk profile. So use a risk-based approach. Uh, services should be run as unprivileged when possible and privilege should be dropped as soon as, as, not, as not needed, right? Because if it's uh, running as root and you haven't implemented the user namespace, then that container could uh, 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 go through the kernel and execute root access level functionality in the other containers. And you should treat root inside a container as if it's root outside the container and only run them uh, containers from the trusted parties, right? Because like with Docker, you can go and download containers from everybody, but who do, like, are these trusted uh, containers? What's in them? Do you know? Have you done an assessment? So try not to do that if, you're not, uh, if you don't have that assurance. And again, follow a layered defense approach, right? Use things like AppArmor, SC Linux, add that extra layer of security as many places as you can. Uh, standardize and verify hardened, use hardened OSs, scan them for vulnerabilities, measure them, monitor and detect them, analyze log usage. All these are standard best security practices. Nothing really new, like you should always be analyzing and monitoring and not trusting, untrust, uh, not using untrusted code. Uh, but again, putting them in perspective in the, in the container world is really important. Uh, real quick slide on API security. So we talked about infrastructure, hosting them in containers, and now we're, we're re-architecting our application. We've got to expose them at APIs. The, things, the lessons to take away is that maintain end-to-end -end trust across the entire journey, right? Because your application is no longer in one bundle. Your application is now being broken into these APIs or microservices, so you need to make sure there's a way that you're doing end-to-end -end trust, whether that's through tokens or some sort of other trust mechanisms, it needs to be designed within your application. Make sure authorization is enforced at the right place with the right level of granularity. Group uh, your APIs to apply configurable security policies consistently, right? So have an API gateway, group them together similar. It's just like users, right? You don't apply user policies per user. You create a group and then you apply the policies at a group level. Managing it that way is much easier and a much better of do way of doing it, right? Same thing here. Don't manage the policy per API. Group similar ones and then apply the policy at the API gateway and enforce it to a group of APIs. And don't forget to log, monitor, and detect. And then, of course, you know, again, follow the defense, defense in depth approach and apply security at all layers. I think I have like two minutes left, and we'll just touch base real quickly. So we've talked about cloud, 
uh, security hosting the applications and exposing them as APIs. Now the delivery channels, right? So you got mobile and web. Well, guess what? OWASP has got some good guidance. So here, are the OWASP has got their top 10. I'm sure most of you have heard of this. Some of you have not. It's a great resource. They publish this uh, and they update it every couple of years. So this is the 2017 update. And these are really good things to consider as you're building your application, right? So have you tested for these things? When you're building it and testing it, have, this is the low hanging fruit. If you can go through and make sure that you've covered these particular threats, you've covered, I'd say 80 or a higher percentage of the threats that are possible. What about the other 20%? Well, hopefully you've designed it following the security by design principles and the 20% have also been, been addressed, right? But the, the OWASP top 10 provides a, a really good uh, starting point for uh, looking at various uh, potential issues with, uh, with, the, with the web applications that you develop, but they also build a mobile top 10. So this is because the mobile channel has intricacies that are different than the web channel or traditional web client applications. So OWASP also puts out a uh, top 10 threats regarding to mobile application development. And these are things that you should be taking to, into account when you're doing your building your test cases and, and, you know, and, and, and strengthening your application. Um, so uh, I think that's about it. I think I've reached uh, my time. Order they are so top ten, yeah. So that's number one to ten. So the most occurring issues. So in the case of mobile, improper platform usage is the number one, followed by insecure data storage. And if you look at the the the, the traditional web top ten, yeah. this injection one is the biggest. SQL injection. Yeah. There are so many attacks that happen through injection. Like I've worked with developers. If we do proper input validation, mm -hmm. it mitigates LDAP injection, XML injection. There is just so many things that just by doing this. And then, you know, of course, broken authentication is also huge. You see so many people that are not taking it, uh, tokens properly or not handling authentication. Session management is not handled properly. So yeah, th these are done based on analyzing. So companies put out their threats, they aggregate it, they do statistical analysis, and then publish this top 10 every couple of years. So I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we don't, I will be here. I'll go outside if the next speaker needs to come. I'm happy to entertain questions of all kinds. <laughs>